I looked out to sea and I could see the size of the waves through the moonlight and I thought, someone's going to die tonight. Dead person. Holy shit. The Pongsu incident was one of the biggest heroin smuggling attempts into Australia ever. Pongsu, if you do not stop or alter course, we will use all measures necessary to stop you. What makes it so interesting is that it had the rogue state of North Korea right at the center of it. Almost 20 years after the Pongsu happened, there's still secrets emerging about this case, about who was involved and how things happened. It was different, different to the ordinary. I'm Richard Baker. I'm a journalist with The Age newspaper in Australia, and I'm the creator and the host of the Last Voyage of the Pong Su podcast. My name is uh, Detective Superintendent Des Appleby. I was the lead investigator for Operation Saw Bay, which was the uh, North Korean bulk carrier, the Pong Su. So I've been a member of the Federal Police for the past 31 years. So the, the Pong Su incident happened back in 2003 down on the Victorian Great Ocean Road, which is a spectacular bit of coastline. Where the action took place was near a town called Lawn. It's a popular tourist town, but normally there's only about 2,000 people living there. It all started with the arrival of three Asian guys in Australia who uh, the police here, the federal police, had some information about, we found out last year, had uh, a human source or a mole in it, someone who, for their own reasons, decided to reach out to the Australian Federal Police officer stationed in Bangkok at the time and actually tip them off as to what was about to go down. We received some information that there was some people down at the Crown Casino in Melbourne that were acting suspiciously. When the police referred to them as the, the shore party. So they were the guys who were going to receive the drugs from the ship and then see that they were distributed to all the uh, end customers. So we mounted a surveillance operation. We do what we call physical surveillance, so we follow people around. We also do electronic surveillance. We can bug your phone, we can bug your uh, computer, we can bug your hotel room, uh, your vehicle. It was really, really rough and heavy weather when the North Korean crew on the Pong Su decided that it was time to get those drugs ashore. And so around midnight, they lowered two blokes over the edge in a little rubber dinghy and 150 kilos of heroin split up into six packages. The police had been sitting on um, the shore party. On that bug, we actually listened to them talk about their girlfriend coming ashore and that was their code for the heroin. We then um, saw them come back to the lawn area and basically sit in a hotel room. These guys eventually went off to bed about two in the morning and were actually careless enough just to leave these packages of heroin kind of lying in the back of the car. We waited till the next morning and then did an intercept of the vehicle and, uh, and located the heroin. You can actually hear Dez's voice when they video and open the package. He says, um, Merry Christmas. And then we went back to the scene where the transfer happened. We located some items concealed under kelp and then a further search, we located a body under kelp that had been buried on the beach. Dead person. Holy shit. Unfortunately for the two guys in the dinghy, only one of them made it to shore alive, the other one had drowned and he smashed his head on some rocks. And then the heroin was strewn around the beach and that, that scene is actually captured in the listening device and you can actually hear those guys' voices talking about one is dead, one is dead and the heroin being so heavy to carry. Uh, it's just incredible, incredible audio. So the next step was to prepare and try and board the vessel. It presents itself as quite logistically difficult to do. They refused to stop, they refused to assist, and they were disposing of items over the side when they saw the police boat. 
So we knew then that we needed to get extra resources. The Royal Australian Navy got called in and a, and a frigate had to go out loaded with 20 Special Forces troops. They did this most amazing boarding in heavy seas off the coast of New South Wales where some of the SAS taken and hover above the Pong Su in a helicopter that's just like, the wind is really wild in the seas there and these guys rappel down the ropes. Yeah, they, they assume control pretty quickly of this ship at sea. And so we went on board. They get the crew together and there's some really haunting vision of, of the crew as well. Some of the crew, quite elderly, could only imagine, you know, what was going through their minds as these, you know, big Australian soldiers with automatic rifles are just standing guard on their ship. Once we got them off and processed them into the custody, we then commenced a search of the vessel. What they did find was, you know, a lot of messages and those messages had a range of instructions on them, like stop the ship, prepare to fight, we'll never surrender. We saw in every cabin there was very much North Korea's leader picture portrait up on the wall. The crew all had these little badges of Kim Jong-il, the dear leader. One of them in particular, when he was asked to remove particularly that lapel badge, uh, he just went off. He didn't want to take it and he told the Australian immigration officer that this was a piece of his heart. There's a lot of intelligence out there that, that links North Korea to drug trafficking. In North Korea, has had an international reputation for being pretty devious and, and very creative about the ways it can earn foreign currency since the 80s, really. The government there has looked to source US dollars or funds for the regime. Police did find one really interesting document in the political secretary's cabin, and that was a, a declaration, if you like, of basically what motivated these guys. They were there to earn foreign currency and to bring greater glory to their nation in the aim of reunification. The crew and the shore party were all arrested in April 2003. It took probably close to three years to get from the point where we were chasing the vessel down to, to actually being before a jury. When it gets to court, most of the crew, like 26, actually don't get committed to stand trial. The four that pleaded guilty, they were sentenced to in the range of 22 to 24 years imprisonment. So those who were put on trial from the ship were the captain, Captain Song, the political secretary, and two of the senior officers ended with a bit of a surprise verdict, which was not guilty. Hello? Mr. Wong, Mr. Wong. Yeah. I've got Richard with me, my friend. I told you about. He just wanted to say hello, you know. Um, hello. How are you? <laughs> Good. How are you? Just as we were putting the final touches on the podcast, I had a coffee with a guy I've known who had spent some time in prison. I was telling the Pong Su story in a podcast, and he told me he knew two of the key guys. They'd spent time in jail together, and I actually got to speak to one of them, Tasa Wong. And it was a really important thing to confirm because actually we were able to reveal that North Korea had owned up that these two men who they had denied for 16 years were North Korean citizens because they wanted nothing to do with the Pong Su story. North Korea had actually issued these two guys with fresh passports and said, yeah, they, you know what, they are, they are us and um, they're coming home. And so they were deported from Australia towards the end of 2019. To be honest, I just couldn't, I couldn't believe it. Obviously, it was a great concern in my mind and, and in people who got to know them, what was their fate when they went home? And I was told that they would have been executed. After this, we basically had the Pong Su cleaned from top to bottom and then we towed it out off the coast of New South Wales. The Air Force was very kind to come along and uh, used it as bombing practice and they, they blew it up uh, using a couple of F-111s and some um, smart bombs. They sent it to the bottom. I'm still learning more about the story, in particular the tie-up between the North Koreans and the organised crime syndicate 
It's the, it's the ship that never sinks for me. The sheer audacity of them actually coming down to Australia and parked right next to the coast of Australia and then sat there for a couple of days, tried to link up with a, a group. It was just uh, audacious. They were bringing uh, essentially six bags ashore. We recovered five and we believe one was lost at sea. Yeah, the local rumour mill down there was running hot for ages about uh, sudden wealth, new cars, new bikes in people's driveways and things like that, that some fishermen might have had a, a better day than they expected when they went out that morning. <laughs>